Amen. Please be seated. It is good to see all of you here this day. Thank you very much for your prayers for us as we travel. As I was telling someone last week, it's always good to travel, but it's always great to come home. So, wonderful to see all of you here this day. Well, before we come to the Word of God for this morning, let's once again pray and ask the Lord's blessings upon our time. Let's pray together. Our great and glorious God, we come to you this morning in that tremendous and glorious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We're so thankful that for many in this place we have been bought by the doing, dying, and rising of Jesus, our Savior. We thank you, O God, that he had us on his heart from before the foundation of the world and that in the fullness of time he actually purchased our redemption. We thank you, O great Savior, for all that you've done. We're thankful for all that you're doing and all that you will do. And Lord, as we come this day to your word, we're asking for fresh help from on high. We're asking, O God, that you would come by the Holy Spirit and animate and anoint all that will be said and done. Lord, that you would give clarity in the word of truth. O God, we are needy. Thus come to us and help us and feed us and strengthen us and build us up in our most holy faith. God, give grace then for these things. And for all of these things, we will praise and bless your most wonderful name. We ask and pray these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In his very helpful book entitled The Potter's Freedom, author James White says that the work of Jesus Christ on the cross is the central theme of the New Testament. He writes, and at its core, the gospel message is the exclusivity of the cross of Jesus. For the death of Christ is the only means of salvation propitiation, forgiveness, and redemption. Well, my dear brothers and sisters here this day, I absolutely agree with Mr. James White, and his words point us in the direction of our topic today concerning limited atonement in connection to our series entitled The Christian and Calvinism. Now, dear ones here this day, please hear me when I say that out of all that we've studied thus far in this series, it is this particular point of the L in the acronym TULIP, which is the favorite target of the Arminians against us. You see, brethren, here is where they say that we greatly go astray. Uh, but having said this, church, I say that nothing can be further from the truth. In fact, I believe that it is at this very point in Calvinism where God Almighty gets the most glory. And I say this because it shows us that far from the work of Christ on the cross being a utter failure as it is in the Arminian scheme, it was actually the greatest success story in all the world. Yes, beloved Brethren, here this day, the death of Jesus Christ was a mission accomplished. It was a satisfaction guaranteed for all for whom Christ died. Now, brethren, although our Arminian friends will argue this point against us, you and I must always remember that the Bible that Holy Scripture alone is to be our final bar of arbitration for all things. You see, brethren, it doesn't matter what other churches are teaching in our day. It doesn't matter what the masses are promoting. No, rather the only thing that matters is what Paul says to us in Romans 4 and verse 3 when he wrote saying, what does the scripture say? And so, 
what does the scripture say about this matter concerning those for whom Christ died? In other words, for whom was Jesus' death intended? Now, of course, of course, if you and I were to ask the vast majority of today's evangelicals the question that I just put forth, they would answer quickly by saying that Christ died for the whole world, right? Yes, they would say that Jesus died for every single sinner who ever lived. Well, even though uh, this is what the masses say, it's interesting to note that historically speaking, there are multitudes of people who completely disagree with this idea. Yes, there are scores throughout church history, whether it was Calvin or Luther or Knox or Tyndale or Spurgeon or Edwards or Whitfield or Warfield or, to modernize it, Sproul or Dr. John MacArthur, etc., who all say that this is completely unbiblical and they say this because they teach and believe that the Bible tells us that Jesus did not die for the entire world. Rather, it teaches that he died for his elect. They say that the Bible teaches us that Jesus died for his sheep. They say the Bible teaches us that Jesus died for his church. They say that the Bible teaches us that Jesus died for those who believe. And so we ask the question, which view is right? I mean, what does the Bible really teach about this matter? Well, uh, this, God willing, is what we are going to consider for today in our time together. Now, as we begin, I want to do so as I have done and we have done together over the past two messages. And so I want to start by quoting to you from the Arminian doctrinal statement of the 1600s concerning the death of Christ. And so first, the followers of Arminius say in their statement of universal or general atonement with reference to Jesus' death that, quote, Christ's redeeming work, listen carefully, made it possible for everyone to be saved, but it did not actually secure the salvation of anyone. They say that, quote, although Christ died for all men and for every man, only those who believe in him are saved, for his death enabled God to pardon sinners on the condition that they believe, but it did not actually put away anyone's sin. Thus, Christ's redemption becomes effective only if a man or a woman chooses to accept it. Now, uh, surely these words that I just read in your hearing sound very much in line with that which we hear non-reformed people saying all the time, right? Uh, this, brethren, is the case. However, for us, for you and I who are reformed, we see many problems with this Arminian statement. I mean, church, we must ask ourselves straightway, did Jesus die on the cross merely to make it possible for everyone in the world to be saved, or did he actually die and save sinners? We ask, does scripture really teach that Jesus just died to make a potential salvation or did he really cry out on the cross of Calvary saying it is finished well uh, brethren the answers to all of these questions are plain if you and I understand our Bibles correctly you see according to scripture the cross work of our Lord was not some random, haphazard work which he did, hoping that it would perhaps be a benefit to some who believe. No, rather, his cross work was the fulfillment of him actually paying the sin debt for all whom he came to save. Church, this is the case. Thus, in response to the man-centered view of the atonement from the Arminians, 
the Calvinists put forth their statement concerning the work of Jesus' death on the cross, saying, quote, Jesus' redeeming work was intended to save the elect only, and it actually secured salvation for them. They say his death was a substitutionary endurance of the penalty of sin in the place of certain specific sinners, and in addition to putting away the sins of his people, Christ's redemption secured everything necessary for their salvation, including faith, which unites them to him. Thus, the gift of faith is infallibly applied by the Spirit to all for whom Christ died, thereby guaranteeing their salvation. Now, quite obviously, dear friends here this morning, quite obviously, uh, this uh, statement here, the uh, rebuttal of the Calvinists to the Arminians, it's uh, quite clear that, as we've already considered in this series already, that the statements are radically different one from the other. You see, whereas the Arminian statement views the death of Christ as ambiguous, as haphazard. The Calvinistic statement views it as that which was absolutely definite in its design and glorious in its accomplishment. And so, having seen these two doctrinal statements concerning Jesus' death, come with me now secondly to note its necessary clarification. It's necessary clarification. The question is, when we who are Calvinists use the term limited atonement, what do we mean? Well, the answer is, I'll answer this firstly negative, by saying in using this term, limited atonement, in using it, negatively speaking, we are not at all limiting the power of Jesus' death or the efficacy of his blood which was shed on behalf of the guilty. So get that straight way. When we say limited, we're not limiting the power of the atonement or the efficacy of the blood of Christ. Brethren, this is not the case at all. For as the hymn writer correctly said concerning Jesus, quote, his blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. And so if this is not what we're saying, what in fact are we speaking of? Well, positively then, when we use the terms limited atonement, we are speaking about its limitation concerning its scope. Concerning its scope. In other words, we are asking, was it in fact Jesus' purpose to die for every single individual in the world? So that, for example, he even went to the cross to atone for the sins of those who were already in hell before he came, to which we who are Calvinists say, no way, Jose. Now, there are many Reformed folks, including myself, who are not entirely happy with the language of limited atonement. We, we don't quite uh, like this language, and this for the uh, various reasons I've already been uh, suggesting to you. Limited atonement. Again, in the mind, sometimes it puts forth the wrong idea. This is the case, thus many of us prefer to use such terms as definite atonement. You've heard that said before. Or particular atonement, or perhaps the best of all, actual atonement. Atonement. That really captures what we're saying. I remember uh, in a church I was part of a long time ago, a pastor's wife saying to me, uh, 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 Pastor Ventura, do you believe in a limited atonement? And I said, no, I believe in a definite atonement. I believe in an actual atonement. I believe in a particular atonement. To which she replied saying, oh. Point is, in her mind, limited meant something which I did not mean at all. What I meant is a definite atonement, a actual atonement. I mean that an actual payment was made to God on behalf of a specific people. Now, having said this, we might also ask, can it be said that the Arminians, in their view of the atonement, 
limit it also. Well, church, I believe that they do, and here's why. They do because while the Calvinist limits Jesus' death with reference to its scope and its intent and its design, the Arminian, those who hold to the Arminian scheme, they in fact limit the death of Christ with reference to its power. They limit the death of Christ with reference to its efficacy, and this is because they hold that Jesus' work on the cross was only designed, quote, quoting them again, to make salvation possible for all men, but that it did not actually secure the salvation of any, which again means that it is limited in its strength. Well, church, as we will see in a few minutes, this is not the case at all. This is not so. For as I quoted earlier, when our Lord died on the cross, he said, not, I hope this will benefit someone someday, no. Rather, he said, it is done. He said, concerning his work, what he just accomplished, it stands finished. And so, Having seen these things, come with me now thirdly in our consideration of our topic in view to note the scriptural witness concerning the doctrine of limited atonement. Now in truth, our Bibles abound with passages concerning the scope of our Lord's death. In fact, as we read our Bibles, we will see that there's absolutely nothing vague with reference to this topic. Thus, instead of our Lord just coming into this world to make salvation possible for everyone, if you're taking notes, Matthew tells us, for example, in Matthew 1 and verse 21, that Jesus will save not all people from their sins, no, but Matthew says that he will, note the emphatic nature of the atonement, he will, again, not save everyone from their sins, no, but Jesus will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21, this is the grand announcement. He will save his people from their sins. Now, of course, we need to ask the important question. Who are Jesus' people? Well, clearly... They're the ones whom we considered last time together when we were considering the second point of Calvinism concerning those who were unconditionally elected to salvation from before the foundation of the world as we considered from Ephesians chapter 1. These are the ones for whom Jesus died who were, quote, according to Paul, Ephesians chapter 1, predestined from before the foundation of the world to be saved both of the Jews and of the Gentiles. Well, further in this regard, again, if you're taking notes in John chapter 10 and verse 15, in speaking to the religious leaders of his day, Jesus himself, this is not Calvin, this is Jesus himself, he says, quote, I lay my life down, and this not for everyone, no, rather he says, I lay my life down, that is, as an atonement for sin, I lay it down, he says, for my sheep. I lay my life down for my sheep. And then in speaking to those same religious leaders in this chapter, in verse 26, he says, but you do not believe. And why? Well, Jesus answers his statement when he says, because you are not of my sheep. Well, in addition to uh, these texts, we also see the definiteness of the atonement of Jesus in the epistles as well. Uh, this is the case, again, if you're taking notes, this is why we're told in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 that God the Father made Jesus, God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Look at the definiteness of the language. For us, that is us who are Christians, us who are believers, to what end? That you and I might become the righteousness of God in him, and then again, highlighting the definiteness of the atonement of Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 13, Paul says that Christ has, not potentially no, but Christ has redeemed us, us who are Christians, us who are believers. Not all people, but us who have been saved. He has redeemed us, Christians, from the curse of the law, and Jesus did this by becoming a curse for us. Now in view of these 
of various texts that I've just mentioned, four or five passages. I must ask, dear ones here this day, is there anything unspecified about the scope or the intent of the words with reference to the death of Christ? Anything unspecified about them? Is there anything not clear from these passages? Or, for example, what we read in Ephesians 5 and verse 25, when Paul says that Jesus, quote, loved the church and gave himself for her. Anything not definite about that? Anything not clear about the language? Well, brethren, I don't think so. Rather, I think that the Bible is very plain with reference to this matter. Thus, it clearly teaches us as we look at passage after passage that Jesus laid his life down for his sheep, he laid his life down for believers, and he laid his life down for his church. I mean, church, listen, so clear is the Lord Jesus Christ about this, that he could say in Matthew 20 and verse 28 that he came to give his life a ransom. Not for all, no, but rather he said, I came to give my life a ransom for many. That's what Jesus said. Not, not for all, but for many. And then, of course, when he was instituting the Lord's Supper, we'll consider it in a few minutes together. What did he say? Matthew 26, quote, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed. Again, not for all, no. That's how some want to read it, but that's not what Jesus said. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. To what end? The remission of sins. Now, of course, there is another line of argumentation with reference to those for whom Jesus died. And it has to do with the whole subject of God's divine covenants, or what is commonly known as covenant theology. And so what then is a covenant theology all about? Well, simply stated, a covenant theology is about the various covenants in the Bible which form the framework through which God's divine plan of redemption was accomplished. You see, church, uh, biblically speaking, covenants, all of the various covenants in Scripture, are the primary structures that God used in order to advance redemptive history, which culminated in the cross of Christ. And all of those structures on the earth are rooted in the covenant of redemption, which God the Father made with God the Son, Jesus, in glory, and that covenant is one which Jesus ratified with his own blood at the cross. Again, this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for many. And so, having said this about covenant theology, perhaps you ask, Pastor, what does all of this mean? What does all of this have to do with our topic at hand? Well, uh, church, what it means is, listen, when Jesus died on the cross, he actually died in order to fulfill the covenantal purposes for which he came. That's what it means. Oh, when he uh, came into this earth, again, it wasn't on some random uh, haphazard mission. No, he, he came to fulfill the covenantal purposes for which he was sent into the world from God the Father. And the covenantal purposes which he came to fulfill was to die for all of those who were given to him from before the foundation of the world in the covenant of redemption. You see, brethren, when Jesus came into this world, he came on a specific rescue mission. Keep that in mind. A specific rescue mission for a specific people and that mission was to pay the sin penalty in full for all those specific sinners who were given to him in eternity past and guess what this is exactly what he has done he at the cross accomplished the redemption of his people his people who were given to him from eternity past by his father in glory and so you see listen Contrary to what the Arminians tell us in our day, our Lord did not come into the world on some undefined mission 
so as just to make salvation possible for all no nor did he merely come to make sinners savable no thus this is why in connection to this whole covenantal theme the lord jesus christ could say to us in john 6 and verse 39 that this is the will of him who sent me that of all that he has given me that is he my father has given me in eternity in the covenant of redemption jesus says this is the will of him who sent me this is the will of my father that of all that he has given to me from before the foundation of the world i shall lose nothing jesus says but i will raise it up in the last day do you see the definiteness of the language all who are given to me i will lose none why because i'm going to die for each and every one of them and each and every one of them are going to go to glory at last who were those who were given by the father to the son of whom jesus will not lose any but raise up in the last day because he died for them well again it is god's elect the answer is it was men and women out of every tribe nation tongue and kindred who deserve nothing but the wrath of god because of their sins against him however in grace in amazing grace brethren you and i were marked out for salvation from before the foundation of the world so that in the fullness of time through the power of the gospel we would be saved and receive everlasting life can anyone say amen that's what it was all about a complete success the atonement of christ this friend is what has happened to you and because of it you should greatly bless the lord your god you were on god's heart from before the foundation of the world and christ actually came on that rescue mission with you on his heart to live the life you should have lived to die the death you deserve to die and to pay your penalty in full so that in the fullness of time through the preaching of the gospel you would hear the overtures of grace and be saved and so having put forth uh, several scriptures which all show us that when jesus died it was for particular individuals not anything of vague and that it was an actual atonement he will save his people from their sins someone might ask the question what about the old testament in other words what does the old testament say about uh, jesus death well uh, perhaps the uh, best old testament passage in this regard is found in isaiah chapter 53 and i ask you please to turn with me there in your bibles isaiah chapter 53 here as isaiah is writing by the inspiration of the holy spirit hundreds of years before our lord came into the world to die for our sins isaiah says in speaking about our subject in summary form in verse 6 of this chapter isaiah 53 in verse 6 look at the words there isaiah says all we like sheep have gone astray Oh, we have turned every one to his own way. It's the bad news. Here's the good news. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, having just read this passage in your hearing, of course, in seeing the words in 6b, uh, that the Lord, that is to say Yahweh, uh, Jehovah, God the Father, has laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. Our Arminian friends uh, quickly say to us, ah, you see, here it is, a universal atonement. Ah, but friends, I say that if we look at our passage carefully, we will see that it does not say that the Lord, God the Father, laid on Christ the Son the iniquity of all, as our Arminian friends would have us to understand it, no. Rather, it says, look closely, that he laid on him the iniquity of us all. Of us all. And so we need to ask the question, who are the us all in this context? Well, if we keep reading the passage in its context, we will see that it's not every single person in the world who ever lived or will live, no. Thus, in speaking about our Lord's death in verse 8 of this chapter, Isaiah writes saying that Jesus was, look at the words in your Bibles, he says, quote, 
taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? Why? For he was cut off from the land of the living. And then in bringing us back to his main point at hand, he says, For the transgressions, not of all people know, but for the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And so we need to ask the important question, which is who are Isaiah's people for whom Jesus died? Well, clearly, if we understand our Bibles correctly, we know that it is the elect remnant of Jews who, like elect Gentiles, were unconditionally chosen for salvation from before the foundation of the world, just as Paul spends Three chapters in Romans teaching us Romans 9, Romans 10, and Romans 11. Uh, dear ones, these are the many for whom our Lord uh, told us in that text I quoted earlier, Matthew chapter 26, that he would shed his blood for the remission of their sins. And so you ask, Pastor, how do you know this for sure? It's a good question. How do you know this for sure? Well, I do so because of what Isaiah says in the last verse of this chapter. The last verse of this chapter. Here as he is speaking to us about the reward which Jesus would receive for accomplishing the redemption of his people. Those given to him from before the foundation of the world by the Father in the covenant of redemption. We read in verse 12 of this chapter. Look at the words with me there in your Bibles. God speaking says, therefore, here's the result. I, again, God the Father, will divide him, that is, Christ the Son, a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. And why is this? Well, he says that it's because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and, look at the language, he bore the sin, not of all, no, but rather he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Well, uh, brothers and sisters here today, I think that this language is is very very plain. Uh, I think it's very simple. I think it's very clear. And again, in these words, we see nothing of a general or a universal atonement concerning Christ dying for every single person in the world who ever lived for people in hell before he came and all the rest. This is not the case. And so you say again, but how could you be so sure? Well, I'm so sure about this, for if this was not the case, verse 11a in this chapter could not be true. Look at the words with me there in your Bibles, 11a. Here in speaking about Jesus' own gratification in having accomplished his salvific mission for his specific people, Isaiah writes saying that he... Again, Jesus shall see the labor of his soul. Again, the labor of his soul when his soul was made an offering for sin on our behalf, as we're told again in verse 10 of this chapter. Isaiah says that Jesus shall see the labor, the agonizing, excruciating labor that he underwent when he stood in the room instead of his people. He shall see the labor of his soul and be what? Well, Isaiah says... He will see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Ah, he'll be satisfied. He will see the fruit, the result, the grand end for which he died. He will see the result of all of it. And Isaiah says he will be satisfied. Now, church, I ask... If on the cross Jesus actually died for the sins of every single person who ever lived in the world or will live, and yet as we know in the final analysis, many of them will go to hell. How could Jesus possibly be satisfied? How could it be? If he really died for every single person, and at last many enter into hell, and experience the wrath of God, clearly Jesus Christ, if he died for them, would not be satisfied at all. Rather, he would be greatly disappointed. Ah, but brethren, 
thanks be to God, this will not be the case. Thanks be to God that for all for whom Jesus' soul was made an offering for sin, each and every one of them, again, out of every tribe, nation, tongue, and kindred, will be saved in the final analysis, and our Savior will be satisfied. And why? For there's not a one for whom Jesus died and shed his blood who will go to hell. Praise be to God. Not a one, brethren, not a one. All for whom he died go to heaven. If not, the atonement of Christ was the greatest failure in all of history. But I say it was no failure. It was the greatest success in all the world. It stands accomplished. It has been done. Oh, but of course, I hear the Arminians saying, I know there are no Arminians here, or we'd have to have you sit outside. But maybe as they're listening to this message, they're saying, he retorts back, well, the reason why some for whom Christ died perish in the final analysis is because of unbelief. That's what they say. Ah, oh, but friends, listen, the problem with this is that it misses the point of what was said earlier in the doctrinal statement of the Calvinists when they said that Jesus' death for his people, in it, quote, he secured everything necessary for their salvation including the faith which unites them to him. And so you see, beloved, and listen carefully. Write it down if you need to. While of course it's true that sinners must believe on Jesus to be saved, it's true. The bigger point is this. Faith is not that which makes the atonement effectual. No, rather, it's the atonement which makes faith effectual in the hearts of God's people. Do you see it? It's not my faith that makes it effectual. It's his accomplishment which makes it effectual in my heart, in the heart of all those for whom Christ died. Brethren, faith is that which was purchased for us who are believers on the cross of Calvary. And this is why in the fullness of time you and I came to believe. Because God ordained it from before the foundation of the world that this would happen. Consequently, this is why the Apostle Paul could say in Philippians 1 and verse 29 that it has been given to us as a gracious gift to, quote, believe on Christ. And so, having seen the doctrinal statements, the necessary clarification, and the scriptural witness concerning the doctrine of limited atonement, let's discuss briefly the matter concerning its common objections. Its common objections. Now typically, uh, the main objections to all that I've been setting forth with reference to these, uh, this doctrine of uh, definite atonement are those passages in the Bible which seem to make a universal application of the death of Christ. Now to be sure, we read our Bibles, we understand, there are several passages like this which uh, teach, for example, that are set forth that Jesus died for the whole world or that Jesus died for all men. And so what do we who are Calvinists do with these passages? Well, what we do is, uh, when, for example, it comes to the word world, uh, we understand that the word world in Scripture has several connotations. That's what we understand. Uh, Pastor Jack read it this morning. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. Really? Has the whole world been convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come? I don't think so. But that's what the text says. Uh-huh. But we need to understand the word world correctly in its own context so that when we read Luke chapter 2, for example, that it came to pass that the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that, quote, all the world should be registered. Someone says, you believe the Bible, right? Uh-huh. It says all the world. Uh-huh. All the world should be registered. That's what Caesar Augustus put forth. We understand here that the word world does not speak about every single person that ever existed at that time in the first century, so that people in China, for example, 
were to be uh, taxed or, or registered by Caesar Augustus, no. Or rather, we look at the word world in the context and we understand the word world to mean the Roman world. Uh huh. We just put a limitation on the word world, didn't we? Uh, the, the known world. And so again, you and I must understand the word world very carefully in uh, Scripture. Additionally, with reference to the word world in the Bible, uh, we also see that when we look at it in its proper context and in connection to the death of Jesus, it's typically not speaking about all people without exception, no. Rather, it's speaking about all people without distinction. And not all without exception, but all without distinction. This is the case. And this was absolutely vital for the New Testament to teach us. And I say this because we might think that uh, salvation is only for one people group, like the Jews. Well, clearly this is not the case because it's, it's for Gentiles as well. Uh, this is the point, brethren. Uh, thus, when John says to us, for example, in 1 John 2 and verse 2, that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, and not only our sins, but also for the whole world. Again, we understand John to be speaking about the whole world in the sense of all people without distinction, but not all people without exception. Our sins, the sins of the Jews, but also the sins of Gentiles. Additionally, the word all. We have the word all in the Bible. What do we do with that? We looked at world. What do we do with all? Well, again, the word all in Scripture needs to be looked at in its context. And as we look at it in context, we have to understand what it is saying. So that in the Isaiah passage that we uh, considered earlier, all refers to what? All believers, us, for our sins, us who are believers. You like Jews and Gentiles, Jesus died. Uh, again, the word all could mean all sorts of people or all kinds of people from, from all different backgrounds. Thus, for example, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter says, in the last day, the Spirit will be poured out, quote, on all flesh. Really? Really? The Holy Spirit's going to be poured out on all flesh? That would be nice, but that's not going to be the case. We know, therefore, it is not referring to every single person in the world because every single person in the world will not receive the Holy Spirit of God. Rather, it means all kinds of people. And then we say, ah, now I'm beginning to get it. I've got to look at the word world in this context. I've got to understand there are several connotations. I've got to look at the word all and, and see what all means there. All kinds of people, all types of people, etc. Well, a last objection then that I want to raise in this regard with reference to uh, the doctrine of limited atonement is in connection to the work of evangelism. Evangelism. Uh, that's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. <clears throat> And you see, those who object to the doctrine of limited atonement often say that because of it, we cannot honestly preach the gospel to all people. And this is because we can't tell individual sinners that Jesus died for them specifically. Uh, of course, as I uh, say that, I think historically, who were the greatest preachers of the gospel who ever lived? Well, it was those who believed in limited atonement. It was Whitfield. It was Spurgeon. It was Edwards. Think about those names. Think about Spurgeon, the thousands who were converted. Think about Whitfield, the thousands who were converted. Think about Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. You say, that man was a Calvinist. That man believed in limited, definite, actual atonement. That man believed that Jesus did not die for all people absolutely, and he was the greatest gospel preacher, one of the many who ever lived. So again, they object and say, well, you can't preach the gospel because you can't tell every individual sinner that Jesus died for them. Well, uh, brethren, let me say straightway, listen, that the gospel message is not that Christ died for every single sinner, but rather that Jesus died for sinners of all sorts. He, he died for the ungodly from all different backgrounds. That's the language of the Bible. All sorts of sinners. He died for the ungodly from all different backgrounds. Thus, isn't it striking to consider that whenever you see anyone preaching the gospel in the Bible, no one ever tells an individual that Jesus died specifically for you. For you. No, he died for sinners. He died for the ungodly. That's the language of the Bible. In fact, the gospel 
is not that which begins with sinners at all. Rather, it's that which begins with Jesus, right? The gospel is the story of Jesus, who in love 2,000 years ago came into this world, sinners to save, and he actually saved them at the cross of Calvary by purchasing their redemption by shedding his blood in their room instead. This is what the good news or the gospel is all about. And this is what we're to tell sinners. We're to tell them the story of Jesus, that in love he made a full, a final, and a free atonement to God the Father for all who believe. And then you urge that sinner to believe. He died for sinners, and we could say, sinners like you and sinners like me, that's all true. But that's not me telling him he definitely died for you and he definitely died for you. No, if you believe on Christ and you're saved, then you know that he died for you. But what the gospel tells us is what Jesus has done. And then what the gospel tells us is what you, my dear sinner friend, must do if you would be saved. You must repent of your sins. And you must trust in Christ alone for life and salvation. And if you do that very thing, you will be saved. The gospel is about what Christ has done. It's about the doing, the dying, and the rising of Jesus Christ. It's about him purchasing the redemption for sinners who believe on him. Thus we urge our unconverted friends, believe, believe, believe. And I would urge you here this day, my dear unconverted sinner friend, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The good news of the Bible is that Jesus actually accomplished the redemption of sinners cross he made a full atonement to god the father for everyone who believes and so you ask if i believe will i be saved absolutely our bibles tell us that whoever call upon the name of the lord whoever calls upon the name of the lord will be saved and the demand of the gospel is that you would repent turn from your sins and put your faith in Jesus' accomplished work. And so, my dear non-Christian friend, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He died. He's made a full atonement for the sins of his people. He accomplished their redemption. He was buried. He rose again. He lives at the right hand of God. And the gospel goes out calling all men and all women everywhere to repent and believe the good news about what Jesus has done. Would you put your faith in him and be saved this day? Would you trust in Jesus, who is the only Savior of sinners? Well, may God grant that that would be so for you. May God Move your heart to understand the work of Christ and to put your faith in it alone as your only ground of acceptance with God. And so, as I begin to wind down before we partake of the Lord's Supper, I want to do so by making a two applications for those of you here this day my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord for you who are the people of God to those of you who've been saved by Christ what can I say to you but simply this first listen because you have been saved with the evidence of a transformed life it's clear that Jesus died for you therefore I say firstly you are to have great assurance in your heart before God, knowing that because Jesus died for you, heaven is all yours. And then secondly, because you have been saved with the evidence of a transformed life, it's clear that Jesus died for you. Therefore, I say to you, 
that you are to have great love for Jesus since he loved you specifically and gave himself for you. Number one, great assurance. Great assurance. The doctrine of definite atonement that Jesus died for his people and that all those people in the fullness of time will be saved. For us who are saved gives us great assurance before God. Great assurance before God. But we say with the hymn writer of old, Bold shall I stand in thy great day, for who ought to my charge lay? Now why could we say that? Answer, Christ has died. If you're saved here this day, dear Christian, with the evidence of that salvation in your life, so that you love Jesus and you worship him and your heart's desire is to please him in all things, it's because he died for you. And because Jesus died for you, friend, you will go to heaven at last. Jesus accomplished your salvation. And when he said it's done, what he meant is that before the judgment bar of Almighty God, we stand accepted. Our payment has been made in full. The penalty due us has fallen upon our Savior, and he has absorbed all the wrath of God in our place completely. So that Paul could say in Romans 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. Dear Christian friend, there's no condemnation now. And there will absolutely be no condemnation for you in the final day. Oh, but you say, Pastor, I failed Jesus so miserably. I'm not as good as I should be. I still sin from time to time. And I just ask you one question. Since when is getting into heaven about your performance? Since when? A dear Christian friend, it's not about your performance. It's about Jesus' performance, and he performed perfectly before God for you. Now that's encouraging. That's encouraging. And oftentimes I'll think of myself and say with Paul in Romans chapter 7, O wretched man that I am, and then I step back and say, remember again, it's not about you, it's about Jesus and as it were, I, I see myself up on the, uh, the, the balcony, as it were, looking down, and I see Jesus coming into the world and living that sinless life on my behalf and on behalf of all of his people, and I just say, oh, isn't this wonderful? Never once did he sin in thought, word, or deed, and God's going to impute to me all of that sinlessness. Oh, it's beautiful. Go, Jesus. Go, 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 go. I'm rooting for him, as it were, in my own heart as I think about the gospel and say, ah, look at it, he accomplished a perfect, sinless life for me. But then he took that sinless life and he willingly substituted it in my place and took my sins upon himself in his great love for me and was punished and crushed for the sins I committed against God. And in that three-hour span, he absorbed all of God's wrath on my behalf and on behalf of all for whom he came to die and then he cried out saying, it's all done. And I just look down as it were upon him and say, amen. And that's why I'm getting into heaven, all because of what Jesus has done. And how do I know that the Father accepted what Jesus did on behalf of his people? Well, the answer is simple. It's the resurrection from the dead. And thus, this is God's validation to all mankind that whoever repents and believes on Christ alone for life and salvation will be saved and will enter glory at last. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. But secondly, then again, as I said, brethren, for us who have been saved with the evidence that in fact we have been saved, it's clear 
that since Jesus died for us, we are to what? Have great love back to him. Why? Because he loved us specifically. I mean, as we come to the Lord's Supper, what are we seeing but the definiteness of the love of Christ for his people? What a love this Jesus, because again, he, he didn't come on some a random mission, maybe thinking about me, maybe not thinking about me. No, I've been saved. He was thinking about me. When he shed his blood, my name, as it were, was on one of those drops. He actually came for me in the covenant of redemption in the fullness of time. He actually lived for me a sinless life. He died a sacrificial death and he made atonement to God for me. Oh, he loved me so much. This is what he's done. And because of what he's done, I say, brethren, we're to love him back. This is why Paul could say, Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, and then he says, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see how definite it is? I live for him because he loved me, Paul says. Me, 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 me specifically. And he gave himself for me, he said, for me. Me, Paul, the great persecutor of the church. Me, Paul, or Saul prior to conversion, but you get it. The great opposer of the work of God. Oh, he saved me. He loved me and gave himself for me. Now, dear Christian friend, this day you ought to feel very special before God. And you know why? It's because you are very special before God. Jesus gave himself for you. You specifically. And thus you specifically should love him back. Should bless his name all the day. And should be thankful to God for all that he's done on your behalf. And so may God grant that some of that Thankfulness will be expressed from the hearts of us, God's people, as we come to partake of uh, the Lord's Supper and then afterwards sing praise to his wonderful name. Brethren, let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we are thankful and well pleased to be in your house this day. We're so full of gratitude for all that you've done for us, the church. We know, Lord, we deserve nothing but your judgment, but you've given us life and that more abundantly. You have forgiven all of our sins. You've redeemed us to God the Father. You have cleared our debt in the courtroom of heaven and have given us the Holy Ghost in our hearts on the earth. And we thank you, Lord, for what you've done. We bless your name for your atonement, your actual atonement, your definite atonement. Thank you for having us on your heart as you suffered and died in the room instead of your sheep. Thank you for dying for our sins and accomplishing our salvation. Help us then, we pray, to think long and hard on these things and encourage our hearts as we come to the Lord's Supper in just a moment. We pray and ask all of these things in your own wonderful name.